We're excited to have an excellent leader in medical education, uh, Dr. Weeders, with us today. Just a heads up to everyone. Um, the presentation will be recorded and made available to students. Before we get started on his presentation, thank you for submitting questions to us. Uh, if there's anything we don't get to today, reach out to the MSC and we can point you in the right direction in terms of resources available, uh, especially anything re related to locking down away rotations or any COVID impacts on your application. Um, we're fortunate to have excellent mentors in EM that have covered the topic in both national conversations as well as other forums. On behalf of the MSC, um, we also wanted to state that with COVID getting worse daily and disrupting every community, um, people we know and our medical education, reach out to me or any of the TCEP MSC officers on how we can help you or your EM interest group. Uh, rest assured, there'll be a lot of opportunities to get to know Texas programs and get involved in EM, especially in the virtual world right now, as well as in the coming weeks and months. So now, we have Dr. Readers. Uh, he's going to speak about a topic he is very passionate about. And for those that don't know Dr. Readers, um, in addition to being the Associate Dean for the Temple Campus for the Texas a and College of Medicine, Dr. Readers is a practicing EM physician and faculty with the Baylor Scott and White EM residency. He's an international speaker in medical education and emergency medicine. He has received dozens of teaching awards but is most proud of meeting expectations as a trophy husband to his wife, the real Dr. Weeders, and he's a proud parent of four children who are all exceeding expectations. His kids all agree he needs improvements in his role as a youth sports coach. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Weeders. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jamari. I'm gonna really try to share my screen here and we're gonna get through this. Uh, as you can see in the background, I am in my closet um, with four kids. I just, I don't have like my cool office or anything like that, but we're gonna make the best out of this. I saw that you guys had submitted some amazing questions and I think they really dovetail with what we're gonna talk about tonight. So I'm gonna try to insert those in. If I don't, we'll circle back. And then at the end, Jamari, we can, uh, take those questions. I hope that this might go 30 minutes or so, but I really want to talk with you guys and help get you to where you need to go. So I was a clerkship director for, gosh, seven years uh, and, and loved that. That's still, I think, hands down my favorite job uh, that I've had. I really enjoyed watching you guys transition from that medical student to intern level, and that's something that I'm still passionate about. And just watching people go through uh, with some great rock stars getting honors, I'm going to share some of their secrets with you and some of the pitfalls that might have kept people out of honors. And so I want to be transparent here and really give you some heads up on things. Um, this is my white coat ceremony, all right, circa 1997. Jamari, where is this picture taken? UT Health San Antonio. <laughs> Bam! Way to go, yes. So I was a, a student there, and this is uh, one of my most beloved photos. It's the only photo I have of both of my parents and both grandparents. The only photo that I own that way. And, and for some reason, this is just such a, uh, a reminiscent time of walking through medical school. And so maybe that's why it's such a rich time in life. But I was there. I mean, it might have been a while back, but then again, it wasn't. Um, I also, I don't have conflicts of interest. TCEP's not paying me for this. Jamari only paid me $100 cash to say good things about him. Um, but no, seriously, I, I take no money. I have no conflicts of interest. You can't email me. My email here is scottweeders at baylorscottandwhitehealth.org. Or if you're on the Twitters, uh, you can get me at EMED Coach. I was shamed into Instagram by my students, and I am a member of the Instagrams, but I have not been as prolific there. So you're going to make a first impression. That's where this starts, right? Um, being a medical student is awkward. So you're wanting to present this beautiful case that you've brought to the program director, and she's standing in front of you. You want to make it look good. The, the chair is right there. She's kind of observing the whole thing going down, and... There's an APD there too, and you're just like in the spotlight, and it's just the suit doesn't fit, you're not comfortable. It is such a nerve wracking first impression. So I just wanna get that out there that there's a lot of anxiety, and I can feel that in a lot of the students that come out and, and do their audition rotations and their first DM rotation. So it's, it's a very anxiety provoking thing. And first of all- No, man, yeah. no, man, I'll tell you. Yeah. That's what I love about these high school girls, man. I get older. They stay the same age. 
Yes, they did. Yes, they did. I, 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 yes, they did. <laughs> I have a teenage daughter, okay? And so Matthew McConaughey, this is my introduction to him. I still cannot take the man seriously as an actor because of the role he played in this movie. It is just such a horrible character that just drives me nuts, and I can't get over it. And my point is that when you show up to the emergency department, if you're dressed in a T-shirt with cigarettes rolled up in your arm and you're trying to be Mr. Cool and it's not working out for you, it's really, really, really difficult to overcome that first impression. So a lot of times we just don't think about things. We're just a little bit too loose sometimes. Uh, the other extreme is when we get nervous, we sometimes want to bolster ourselves out. It's that fight or flight stimulation. You, get a, you want to bust your chest out and show, hey, I'm so powerful and strong. And then it might end up like Ricky Bobby. And we'll see if this video comes through. No, that didn't. Okay. Basically, he's just a big, hairy, American winning machine, you know. He's just amazing, and nobody can touch his stuff. And so you have to be kind of crazy the way you go out there and be aware of yourself. It's that emotional intelligence that's going to give us, I think, the best bang for the buck when you're able to gauge your emotions and the emotions of others around you and regulate those things. So you're thinking, Weeders, what should I do? You're kind of freaking me out a little bit here. But I'm going to give you the recipe for success. And I'm going to walk through this piece by piece with you. Before you walk into the emergency department, you've really got to understand our philosophy. It's so much different than everything else, and I'll explain it. You start up your presentation with a one-liner, not a deep story. Your H&P has got to be filtered from the cacophony that the patient gave you. Your review of systems now stands for ROS, rule out serious. And so the way you report your review of systems is going to fit a rule out serious narrative. Your exam is going to start explaining your differential diagnosis. And your MDM is not medical decision making. It's make a decision, ma'am. Come on, let's get on with things. You've got to make a decision. If you season this recipe with a little bit of evidence-based medicine, that always adds a nice flavor. And then the cherry on top, the possessed to be resolved, is you need to get specific about your recommendations and make a commitment. So I'm going to walk through each of these with you, and we'll go ahead and, and digress and, and go deeper into each of these different recipe ingredients. The philosophy. Okay, emergency medicine is about emergencies. It's not about benign conditions that can be worked up as an outpatient. It's not about common things. It's about the worst case scenario. We want to know what's going to kill you immediately, what's going to leave you dismembered and disabled in the next few days and then also what's going to stop you from becoming chronically disabled long term so we need to really get in front of these things if we can so when you walk into the room and someone says something like well doctor i think i've got a headache and it's a migraine your initial response is i don't believe you i am totally convinced you're going to die from this headache you must prove to me that this is just a migraine headache by me answering or asking you a lot of interesting questions that are gonna cover all of the other emergencies. Because my bias, my standpoint, my lean, my bent, is that you're going to die. I am 100% convinced you're going to die. I'm not believing you this is a migraine, and you gotta prove it to me. And so if you walk in with that mindset, and you ask questions, and you do your physical exam, and you think about the patient with that EM philosophy, I think you'll find out that your presentation, your medical decision making, your medical knowledge will be transferred to your supervisors in a more robust manner. The other thing is it's got to be on your mind is where are we going to go with this? You've got to have a discuss the relationship talk. You know, where are we going with this thing? Are you going to go to surgery? Are you going to go to the ICU? Am I maybe working with a plan to send you home? Really, disposition is king in the emergency department. So on the back of your mind, you need to be constantly thinking about is what is going to take to get this person to the next destination in the medical system? What preemptive things can I address that will allow you to go to the operating room? Maybe prevent you from being rejected by the admission service? Or what is it that I need to do to make sure it's a safe transition to home and an outpatient strategy? So convincing yourself the patient's going to die and understanding where are we going are the two big key factors right now. This is often a paper. Some students say, well, if I want to dig deeper, what do I do? This is a little bit old, but it's good. So this is an older paper, but it's a three-minute presentation, a variation on a theme. If you want to read more, this is probably my go-to article that I'll send students. It's a classic. It's kind of like Hemingway. It's, it's just something that you probably want to read and need to read. All right. You guys, as MS 2s and 3s, are trained to be reporters. I mean, you basically, you look at a script, and you just ask a bunch of questions. You know, ma'am, have you felt tired? No? 
Okay, have you had a fever? No. Okay, have you had chest pain? No. And you just go down this ridiculous list, right? So the questions don't have an order. They don't have a, uh, a real direction. They're just random questions, and you report that. And then your presentation, when you go in to present to things like internal medicine, you just vomit up everything that you've heard. That's all you do is you just tell them all the ridiculous questions you ask, and then at the end, you might put it together. But in emergency medicine, you don't have all that time, and you need to really put this together fast. So I, the real students that are going to shine are not the reporters, but they're the interpreters. It's that whole rhyme mnemonic. So reporter, interpreter, manager, and then expert. I'm still at the manager stage. I want to be an expert one day. After 20 years, I'm working on it. But you want to be that interpreter. And I'm going to show you how that looks. All of our presentations might need to start off with a one-liner. Now, if you come into the room and you say, well, Dr. Wieters, uh, I talked to this very nice elderly lady who is having um, chest pain. And she said that, you know, when she was ordering pizza, she heard her dog bark and then looked outside and saw some lights driving down the road. And then the phone rang and then she started to have chest pain. I mean, you've already lost me. You've already lost me with this story. So you got to come up with a few one-liners. Did it hurt when you fell from heaven? A little. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to go. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that, that is not the one-liner I'm talking about. Okay. A one-liner might be, um, Dr. Wieters, I just saw a patient who's 65 with a history of ischemic heart disease who has typical chest pain and is sweating. I want you to come to the bedside right now. I'm concerned about this patient. Oh, okay, I got it. Um, Dr. Wieters, I've got a person that I think might have appendicitis and I want to tell you more about this patient. Okay, sure, let's talk, you know. I have a stable child with, with viral symptoms that I want to discuss with you. Oh, thank you, let's talk, you know. So you're framing it with a one-liner and the one-liner can be difficult. After that, we go into the HPI and if you've taken care of patients before and you've interviewed Americans, you know that people are just going to give you this noise and it looks like alphabet soup and they've got this tangled story of nonsense that you're trying to make sense of. They're distracting you with things that don't matter. You're letting them be, you know, conversive because you don't want to be rude. You're letting them talk, but you really need to filter out what they're saying. And then you've got to take what they're telling you and you've got to turn that into an organized HPI. You've got to hit that onset, the position, the quality, the radiation, the severity, the timing. You've got to filter those in and hit all of those gears when you present this case. So filtering that out and just sticking to the facts is key in emergency medicine because we don't have the time that we do in other uh, fields. So brevity and organization is going to be key here. Next, your review of systems is not a list, but you are defining your differential diagnosis. And again, review of systems, ROS now stands for rule out serious. So if I've got a person with a headache, my review of systems should not contain something. Let's say it's a 30-year-old male with a headache, and you come in with a review of uh, systems. You say, Dr. Readers, in my review of systems, there's no dysuria. And I give you that like confused puppy dog look like, why would that even be relevant to this guy's case? You've got to really understand what is serious about someone with a headache. So in that case, I want to have a fever. No fever, Dr. Readers. Oh, I got you. He's thinking about meningitis. Dr. Readers, there's no vision changes. Oh, now she's thinking about glaucoma. Now I understand. Dr. Readers, there's no weakness or numbness. Oh, now she's thinking about a stroke. I understand what she's into. Now she's really going through this as a ruling out the serious in the review of systems. So each of those questions needs to be calculated. It needs to be pertinent, and it needs to rule out serious for review of systems. Filter out all the other nonsense. Make it clean. Make it crisp. Next things are vital signs. This should be like a hard stop, a never miss, a, a never occurrence. If you go through a history and you don't get vital signs, that is Taco Bell mild sauce. I'm sorry. You've got to bring something stronger than that. Don't come up with some weak excuse like, well, I couldn't find it in the nurse's notes. No, you can feel their pulse. You know what their heart rate is. You can measure respirations. Most people have monitors. They've got a SAP probe. They've got a temperature. Okay, so find out the answers to these questions. Don't bring that weak presentation up and forget the vital signs because that is a hard stop, easy way to fall on your face. Now, you don't have to read out the vital signs. I don't want you to read these vital signs, which are fairly normal. You don't need to read that to me. I think most people are understanding with the vital signs are normal. Maybe if there's a special case, like a patient with a shortness of breath, you could say something like, well, uh, the vital signs are normal. Specifically, their SATs are 98% and their breathing is well controlled at 12. Oh, okay, gotcha. 
The other thing is you need to understand the language and the philosophy of, of emergency nurses. Our nurses run the place. I don't know if you know this yet, but the nurses run the emergency department. You think it's the doctors, but it's really the nurses. So the smart student will pay attention and listen to the nurses. So what if a nurse writes down someone has got nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and their heart rate's 99? That is kind of an odd number in a lot of different ways. They, the way you get vital signs in triage is you watch a SAP probe, and it will go up. It'll go up to 105, 110. It'll come down to 95, 94. It fluctuates by about 10. It's respirophasic, and it's different. Now, why would that nurse write down 99? They could have written down 105. They could have written down 95. But they chose 99 for some strange reason. It's a really odd number. What the nurse is trying to tell the team is, yes, this person is a little bit tachycardic, but I don't think they're critically ill or sick. Because that one point of 100 heart rate versus 99 puts them into a higher emergency department category for risk. Another student might come in and say, well, triage you know, clocked this guy at 99. His heart rate, when I assessed the patient, it was 115. I'm concerned they're volume depleted. So that's the honors level interpretation of vital signs that the, the honor student will note. So make sure you're understanding those vital signs. All right, your exam, again, should not be a list. It should be a differential diagnosis. So the same way Review of Systems was talking about the pertinent findings, don't tell me that someone has no chipping to their nails when they've been there for chest pain, okay? I don't care what their nails look like, all right? Um, if someone's there for a fractured ankle, I don't care if they've got normal active pupils. You know, that doesn't mean anything to me. So make sure that you're not giving a list, but you're giving a differential dose, uh, diagnosis. The other thing is, if you're going to examine someone's groin and post it on Google for a picture, please wear gloves. I mean, this is just horribly disgusting. I'm so sorry. I, I found this picture, and I can't believe people are actually doing this kind of stuff, but that's disgusting. Please wear gloves, okay? Please. All right. Medical decision-making, MDM. You need to be worried, again, about the worst-case scenario. If your first thing on the differential diagnosis is, uh, this is probably a virus, it's not much, uh, maybe just a migraine, that's really going to cause some doubt within your supervising physician that day. So again, medical decision making is not MDM. MDM stands for make a decision, ma'am. And we need you to make a decision. All right. If any of you ever been a waiter or waitress and you've gone to a table and you've asked somebody what they want to order and they just vacillate for like 20 minutes on, oh, I don't know, maybe it's a linguine. Oh no, maybe what sauce should I get? And, oh, I don't know. What are the sides again? And you're like, man, there is a freaking list of the sides right in front of you. So if you've ever been a waiter or waitress, you've understood the frustration with someone when they're vacillating and they have not made a decision. You need to be decisive. You need to make a decision. And it has to be done with humility. So how does that sound? How do I make a decision and commit but not sound arrogant? So it might sound something like this. Something like, you know, Dr. Weeders, I, after all the differential diagnosis, I'm really I'm concerned this person might have a peritonsillar abscess. And I, I might be wrong, so I really would be interested to see what you think. Would you mind seeing the patient with me? You know, there's a lot of things here, and I'm not sure what the end diagnosis is going to be, but if I had to put my money on it, I would, I would bet that it's pneumonia, but we still have to run a lot of other tests to rule out other things, okay? So that's how you commit, but you, you maintain humility, all right? You're not climbing El Tapitan with, with no rope, all right? That's crazy. I'm sorry. You got to bring a rope. You got to bring some humility to the table. And so how does that sound? So a lot of times I've seen students make a mistake. There's kind of two standpoints that you can get to. And, and most students kind of stand in the middle on this, right? Some of you are a little bit more aggressive. Some are a little bit more conservative in the way that you address patients. So just find out where you are right now. But some of the things I've seen from the students will say things like, you know what? The aggressive students say, oh, this guy's fine. You know, I've got a really good clinical diagnosis skills. They're fine. And you know what? I'm better than the drug screen. I can tell when somebody's a drug seeker. This guy's a drug seeker. I know for sure, you know? Or maybe, you know, in San Antonio, we see a lot of sick people. Uh, I've seen worse than that. It's not anything bad. I wouldn't scan this guy. We don't need to admit him. No, I, I know what sick looks like, okay? So you're trying to really, like, demonstrate your knowledge or skill set if you're differential diagnosis. But, but that really lands in a dismissive and an arrogant manner. And I would caution you against making those arrogant uh, claims. I would ask you to commit with that humility. So how does that look? So maybe instead of they're fine, you can say something like, you know what, I think this patient is going to be okay for discharge, but I'm still really concerned. I think we do need to do some like observation in the emergency room. I think we need to run some tests and maybe give him a trial with some antimedics. You know, maybe we should just take this person seriously for a bit. I get a weird vibe that maybe there's some 
you know, drug uh, abuse potential in this patient, or maybe there's some, you know, functional components to their symptoms. Um, or, or maybe, you know what, I think you're okay, but this, this sure might be dangerous, and maybe we should do a workup. And so when I think you commit with that level of humility, that lands in a respectful to the patient. It, it lands in a careful uh, demeanor towards the medical condition. And I think it shows that you understand that emergency medicine is a series of landmines that any of us could step in any day. So wherever you're at on the spectrum, I would cause you to take one step over towards the conservative, respectful, careful side by using this language, by thinking the EM philosophy and having some diagnostic humility. Because if you haven't made a mistake, you haven't misdiagnosed or, or made a horrible medical error in your life, boy, it, it's coming soon. Believe me, I've made a lot of them. It's gonna happen. Now, everything tastes better with seasoning. How do you season your medical decision making? Well, you use some of the evidence-based medicine things that I'm listing here. So it might sound something like this. I, I'd like to send this person home with chest pain. Well, why would you wanna do that? Well, in all my, all my years of medical school training, I feel like I have a clinical acumen that would save this guy home. You say, well, you've been a medical student for three years. That is certainly one level of evidence. That, let's, let's talk about that. Or you could say something like, well, this person has a heart score of three, and I'm aware of this evidence-based medicine. When I apply this to the patient, they meet a low-risk criteria. This person with pneumonia has a high CURB-65 score. I think they need to be admitted, okay? Um, based on Nexus, I don't believe we need to do a CT scan of this person's neck. So those are how you can season your presentation with evidence-based medicine and demonstrate that you have a knowledge of some of the core fundamental research in emergency medicine that bases our decisions. So season your presentation with some of these. And I'm just listing a few of the common ones here, but if you'll know a few of those and at least have a working definition as you use and apply those more, I think it's gonna to start to become more natural. One of the questions that I heard was, what are the common pimp questions I should expect in emergency medicine, all right? You're looking at about eight of them right here. Become aware of these, become aware of some of those studies. Well, why do you wanna send that person home? Uh, why do you not wanna get a chest CT on this person? Well, they're perk negative, that's why. Oh, she said perk. Oh, this is a good student. So just learn some of those things. Next is you wanna get specific, okay? Taco Bell mild sauce is, yeah, I think the patient's in pain. Maybe we should give them some pain medicine. Okay, that's certainly one level of management. Maybe the uh, next level of hot sauce is gonna be, well, I'm gonna actually commit to a medicine. Maybe Tylenol, maybe Tordol. You know what, I'm gonna choose morphine. Okay, what's the obvious question that leads into that? Okay, medical students, how much morphine? Ooh, I don't know. I didn't take the time to look that up because I am just a mediocre medical student. The great medical student will say, I've looked up the dose. It's uh, 0.1 per kilo. I went ahead and put some orders in. And you know what? Maybe even I've noticed that the patient's got renal failure. So maybe serial doses of morphine wouldn't be the best answer, but maybe we should try to lot it. So that's how you distinguish yourself amongst a sea of great medical students. You get specific with your recommendations and you preemptively are aware of the next pimp question that's going to happen. Now trip ups. Um, maybe um, sometimes um, you like say like filler words like every um, time like before you open your mouth. We all have our hangups, mine is posture. My wife, the real Dr. Weeder, she always says, Scott, sit up straight, come on, where's your posture? All right, that's my hangup, it's, it's my Achilles heel. Maybe it's your attire. Again, if you show up dressed like Matthew McConaughey and Dazed and Confused, ain't gonna get you much respect. So you gotta look like a medical student. You've got to earn the professional reputation of the doctor to your patients and also to your faculty. So take your aunt's sweater, leave it in the closet. Take that North Face hoodie, leave it at home. Go for the white coat, go for crisp, go for scrubs, look like a doctor, act like a doctor. And if you've got hangups and trip ups, hey, get some help. There's help out there, okay? So get some help. The way to get help is by repetitive motions with feedback. Gladwell's maybe my favorite author right now. I love reading the guy. He's like nachos. I can't put him down. Uh, Gladwell writes about doing things 10,000 times. I am just now, after 20 years of practice in emergency medicine, just now writing my 10,000th chest pain chart. I'm just now starting to become an expert. So student, do uh, you want to go see this person with back pain? No, I'm good. I've seen enough of that. I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, don't do that. You need the practice. 
a student, you need to write a note. Um, I've been writing a lot of notes. I'm pretty good. Thanks. No, you need work. The other thing this reminds me of is this is hard. It's not easy, and it comes with practice. If you just do mindless repetition without feedback, you're going to continue to be mediocre. If you think you're good enough and stop like the yellow line, you're going to be okay, but you're not going to improve. You need that continuous feedback. Everybody needs a truth teller. You've got to have a friend, a colleague, a mentor that can tell you the truth. I have a number of them. This is being recorded. My mentor will watch it. I will watch it myself. I will get feedback. I will be corrected, and I will do a better job next time because I've gotten that feedback. If I just do this and crumble it up and throw it away, I'm not helping anybody out. This takes time. The best medicine you can take, and it's painful, but it's tasty and it's good. You need to do the presentation selfie, all right? You just see a patient. Everybody got a smartphone. You find an empty room, a bathroom, something like that. You get your phone out. You record yourself doing your one-minute presentation. You then push play. You will start to sense the feelings of nausea, headache, fatigue, dizziness, and palpitations. Some of you may experience side effects such as seizure and syncope. You may wet your pants at this time and lose continence. That's okay. It's expected. It's painful. Believe me, this is one of the most healthy things you can do. Watch this. You will discover your trips, your hangups. You will discover gaps. Your speed may be fast or slow. You will better diagnose your shortcomings and then be able to address them. Send this over to your friend, your truth teller. Get them to give you some feedback. Believe me, this is good medicine and you need it. Quick break for questions here. Um, if none come up, I can go ahead and answer a few of them, but why don't we take a few questions? Yeah, I have a question. So I've worked with an uh, emergency doc who likes, um, I guess, more complete presentations, like including social history, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, is it appropriate to ask the doctor you're working with what kind of presentation they prefer, or is it better just to kind of do like the short version and if they ask for a longer version, give that one? Man, that is a great question. I think that was one that some of the uh, people sent in and a variation of that question, so it's a very common one. I'll say a couple things. So yes, people do like different things. The joke in residency is treat the attending, not the patient. Um, so. The way you should go about this is if you're in a residency program, you have big brothers and sisters that are residents that will guide you. They might say things like, hey man, if you leave out social history and you present the leaders, he will break your head off. Make sure you say that. They like long presentations, they like short presentations, they don't like to be presented to, they will guide you. Um, it's reasonable to say, you know, if you have some guidance on my presentation, let me know, otherwise I may just go for it. That's a very open question, they have a choice and then you can kind of tailor that to their likings. Because you're right, these are my opinions. I feel like they're the opinions of a lot of my colleagues. I used to give this talk and I'd insert videos in a longer format of all of the clerkship directors in Texas, and I took all of their ideas and put them into this presentation. So that's where the source of this came from. But that's a great question. I think use the big brothers and sisters of your residency program, and then it's fair to ask. A related question that I saw was, I have trouble finding the right time to update my resident about the patient. What's the etiquette on updating resident status without pestering them? Great question, right? So you don't want to follow the resident to the bathroom and make announcements and updates while they're washing their hands. But you might ask something like, hey, I wanted to check in with you and run the list. I've got some updates when you get a chance. Okay, cool. Now, it shouldn't wait to be and by the way, the person in Bravo 6 does not have a pulse and not breathing. I just want to be respectful because I saw you reading. Okay. So if it's critical, you got to jump in there and say something. But otherwise, I think the good medical student will have that update ready. You don't want to be caught with, hey, can you give me some updates on your patient? And then you're like, I, no, let me go. I, I didn't know that I was supposed to do that. Okay. So get in there. You need to be the one, the, the honor student will be the one that will reassess after a medication has been given. They will be the ones that will do a PO challenge for the patient, making sure they can tolerate fluids. They're going to reassess vital signs. They're gonna be the ones that, excuse me, will announce that the tests are back and that there's a disposition ready. And then ask the resident or your attending, hey, I've got some information. Let me know when you have a chance. I'd love to catch you up on some things. That might be a consideration. 
let's see, maybe time for one more, one more question. Maybe we'll uh, move on. How are we doing on time, Jamari? Got about 28 minutes left, 7.30. So we're good on time. I get a quick question, Dr. Readers. Yes. How much of your presentation should be, I guess, just face-to-face -face talking to your attending? And I guess what I'm really asking is how much looking at your notes is okay? Oh, good question. Yeah, how long do you go with the training reels? So I think it's, um, it's a pitfall to go in with like nothing in front of you. I feel like that's dangerous. You're kind of like, you know, tightrope walking without a harness. I feel like it's good to have a list in front of you. But if you're just, if you're just reading the notes, it's kind of like a lecture where they're reading bullet points, right? Nobody likes that. So we don't want you to read your diary to us about what you took. We do understand you might need to refer back to it. But I think like any personal conversation, if you can balance reflecting on your notes with making eye contact with the, the physician, I think that really helps out. And that's more of that, again, you've got to read the room and your audience and understand the balance of things. As you get better and as you get more reps and become more to that interpreter, manager, expert level, I think you're going to find that you're going to require your notes a lot less. But I think it's a very good idea to take notes, organize the thoughts in the way that you think so that you can go back and refer to them. I was a guy I loved brain mapping, okay? I'd write a chief complaint in a bubble. I'd make some lines across the side, and then I would use that technique. That was the way I thought. You might have a different way. Great question. All right, so my summary. Understand the emergency philosophy. Start with a one-liner. Filter and organize the H&P. Review of systems is not review of systems. It's ruling out serious. Your exam is a differential diagnosis. MDM means make a decision using evidence-based medicine to season things, and then the cherry on top is to get specific. All right, procedures. You wanna nail procedures, you wanna get in the game, you wanna be there, you want the person to put the ball in your hands, win the free throw line, two minutes left in the game, you wanna be that person. How do you get there? One of the things I hear students doing a lot in young learners is they're so concerned with the part of the procedure that they view as most important is watching the tube go through the cords or seeing the flash of a central line or putting the Kellys in the chest for a chest tube. That's what people tend to think about. They think about the placement when they should be thinking about the preparation. Preparation for procedures is so much more important than the actual placement. I cannot emphasize this enough. And if you understand this mindset, you will become more successful in your procedures. By failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. It is all about preparation. One of the ways that I think it's safe to prepare, it's mistake, uh, oh, it's okay to make mistakes in simulation. Uh, most centers and schools have simulation equipment. You've got your EMIG, you've got your friends and colleagues, your truth teller. Get together, go through this, and make some mistakes on some plastic mannequins. Go through this, practice that preparation. We've got trainers, we've got ultrasounds. I know even in our workroom in the emergency department, if nothing's going on, we're gonna get out some stuff. One of my favorite activities to do is to hand a medical student a central line kit. I mean, it's an old worn out one, it's expired, it's not valuable. But I say, hey, open this up and lay things out in the order that it needs to go in the patient. I'm gonna come back and check on this person. I want you to teach me what we need to do next. That's a helpful exercise, it really is. So go through, watch the videos, spend some time. There's a lot of great videos that are free. You guys have resources online. Watch central lines being put in, get those things out. I mean, you can put a central line in a water bottle or a styrofoam cup. I mean, you don't have to have a high dollar fidelity trainer. You can do this stuff at home. I would encourage you because the placement is not the key. It's the preparation, it's the organization, it's the micro skills, and that's that muscle memory of going through those repetitions that's going to allow you to be a successful uh, proceduralist. You've got to be aggressive, but you've got to be safe. If I have to pull you away from the computer because you're, you know, on the Insta Facegram times, then to get you to do a procedure, that's not going to work out well. You probably won't get the cheese. But if you come up to me and you say, Dr. Weeders, you know what? Um, I've been managing this patient with sepsis. Their blood pressure is soft. We're going to get to the ICU. They need a central line. I, um, I gained the rapport of the family because I have looked like a doctor and treated them with respect, and I've, I've gained their trust. 
Um, I've reviewed their labs. There's no contraindications for a line. I've reviewed their anatomy. They seem to be, uh, you know, a, a reasonable case. Um, they have consent uh, with the resident. I've watched the New England Journal of Medicine videos. I've been practicing for three weeks with this central line kit. Would you put me in the game? I'm probably going to say, yeah, let's give this person a chance, right? Yeah, she's done her work. Let's go ahead. Let's give them a chance. So you've got to be aggressive, but you've got to be safe. Sometimes there may not be the best patient. The COVID patient that's drowning in their own uh, hypoxia might not be your good first airway. So we've got to be aggressive, but you've got to be safe. As you're moving through the emergency department, there's always going to be that million-dollar question. Okay, medical student, what should we do next? A lot of safe answers here, but the best one that is like so difficult to disagree with. If it's a difficult thing that you need to make a nuanced uh, algorithmic choice and using evidence-based medicine and you feel uh, uncertain about it, you can always punt. And the best way to punt is, you know, Dr. Weeders, I need to go back to the bedside and reassess that patient. That's what I need to do. I'll come back. Can I reassess the patient? I can never disagree with that. That is the perfect answer. If you want to get one more EKG, you want to do one more abdominal exam, you want to go talk to the patient again, you want to get more vital signs, those are always perfect ways to escape the trap of being stuck and not knowing what to do. That always buys you some time. So go and reassess the patient, take a different perspective, look at them from another lens, start over with your history, reassess that patient. That's always a good thing to do. Again, with, with feedback, I can't say this enough. Uh, this is kind of two talks coming together, but just like with your presentations, you need to get feedback on your procedures. You need to get feedback on that. So find your truth teller, get your attending to walk through this with you, find some nurses, find a friend, do this together. Get that feedback so that you can be prepared for those procedures. Let's see, how do you get good feedback? This was a question that came up, so I threw a few slides in here. You know, uh, the question was, uh, what is the best way to ask for feedback? You know, I'm just going to say this. In America, we're very nervous about giving people feedback. No one wants to make a judgment about someone that's not stellar. No one wants to be told they're average. No one wants to have them say anything that is less than perfect. It is difficult. It's challenging. It's hard. It's really hard. One thing you can do is you can ask in a lot of different ways. I can say something like, um, what feedback do you have for me? That's very general. It's like throwing a hook without any bait into the water expected to catch a fish. Now, another thing would be, what if I threw some bait on that hook? I might catch a fish. It might be a specific bait. I'm fishing at a certain angle. I'm fishing for a certain fish. I'm looking for something specific. If you ask your resident and start off your shift and say, you know what? I've been thinking about things. I'm really having trouble with the central line stuff. I get mixed up with things. Can we work on that? And maybe if the chance comes, I could get a chance to put that central line in. Or maybe, you know what? We don't have a neurology rotation at our, at our medical school. That's kind of a weak point of mine. I tend to do worse on that section than the MBMEs. I want to learn more about neurology. Or maybe I have trouble committing to a plan. My differential is not deep enough. Can we work on that this shift? When you've studied yourself and then you've confessed that to your supervisor, that shows them that you are a self-reflective learner, that you're able to identify your gaps and you're open to feedback. You've also extended permission to that person to give you that feedback. And that's what we need sometimes. You've also given them direction. At the end of the shift, it may come back and say, hey, I gave you a few presentations today. I wanted to get better with my medical decision making. What did you see and how can I get better? You see how that's so much different than just asking, what could I do better? Do you have any feedback? So study yourself, give permission, and I think you'll catch much better feedback. Other questions, what can I do preparing for my EM clerkship? Read, okay? Go to the CDM curriculum student portal. Read our um, online curriculum. That's going to be the spine for most of these cases. Find something to read. Go ahead and do some procedures. Use the Sim Lab. I think I've pointed out some of the things that you need to consider doing, but those are the things I would advise you to do as you prepare. Let's see. I have a, a fun slide to end on, but I will uh, take a break and take some questions if you guys have them right now. I have a quick question, Dr. Readers. Um, when, when working with residents, um, for the medical students, is the expectation to wait until the resident has seen the patient, or if they're popping up on the board, should you go see them before the resident just to avoid like stepping on toes? I wouldn't want to see a patient in front of the resident and 
get in the way? That is a great question, Billy. So that's something you need to start off the shift with, okay? Because right now in COVID, uh, your school and your center might say something like, hey, wait before you go see somebody because you might walk in the wrong room, okay? So the things are going to be different now than what they might have been in the past. So if you're reading what we did last year or talking to residents about this is the way I did it, be careful. Start off your shift with, hey, I really want to do the right thing here. I don't want to cause infectious problems for our team or myself. Can you give me some guidance on how you want me to go see patients? You know, that's a great question that you need to start the shift off with because I bet you're going to get a lot of different answers. Most of the time, we want you to be aggressive about picking up your patients and going and seeing them without being prompted. And that's a key thing. Can the student perform independently without prompting? If I have to prompt you to give me a management plan, that's weak. If I have to prompt you to get up off your stool and go see a patient, that's weak. So without prompting. But again, you have to ask for permission, have to maybe understand that as you start the shift. And even within one center and one residency, you might get a different approach from a different resident. So that's a great way to start the shift. I think a great question, Billy. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Question, how do you approach requesting a slow? Is there a certain etiquette that's appreciated? Yeah, I think this is an interesting thing. So um, you're not guaranteed to get a slow. Uh, some centers, I know there's some people that say, look, if you never ask me, you never ask me. You gotta ask. So I think it's always a good idea when you go to a program, even if it's your home rotation, make sure you introduce yourself to the program director. Try to set up a time. Go and meet them if you haven't already. Remind them that you're there that month. This doesn't need to be a three-hour meeting, but just kind of a basic, hi, I'm XYZ student. I'm so thankful that I'm able to rotate with you this month. Um, I know I've heard a lot of good things about the program. I'm excited. Um, you know, good to meet you. Usually programs will have some sort of organization where they will guide who will direct your letter. It might be an APD, a clerkship director, a program director, they might assign a mentor, they might do a group slow. So just like the answer to the last question, it's important to understand what the expectations are for the program as you're entering into the program. There may be a lot of different things. And so on day one of the orientation, if they don't mention that, you need to ask. What is the process here for obtaining a slow? Is it individualized? Is it corporate? Is it expected? Do I need to ask permission? How can I help? Most people will like a request. I work with you, program director, the most. I uh, work with you, APD, or clerkship director, the most. I, I want to make sure that I get a, uh, an accurate slow. Can I offer any of my credentials, CV, resume, personal statement to assist? I thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really had a great month. I think taking the courtesy to not, ex not expect that but to ask the hard questions and then politely request is the approach I would encourage you guys to take. Um, the follow-up to that was, can you request specific information that you want to be added to the slow? No, you can't. That's not uh, kosher, I would say. Yeah. But again, you can offer up your resume and your, your CV and things like that. Let's see. Maybe there's some underclassmen on the call today. Here's a question that was written in. Uh, what can we do in our preclinical years to make us more competitive for emergency medicine? So I think the answer to that is, is show up and do some shadow shifts. It doesn't have to be 12 hours. It could be three or four. Uh, introduce yourself to these people. Join the EMIG. Meet the leaders of your department. Uh, find a mentor early. Consider research if you're interested in research. If you don't like research, don't do research. If there's a quality improvement program, jump onto it. If there's a committee, consider joining for a student's perspective. Become active. That's my point. Showing up tonight, you're doing the right things. If you showed up tonight and you're listening and pay attention to this, you've kind of delineated yourself as someone that's on the task, that uh, I think is engaged, that's heading in the right direction. You're asking the questions. So I think those are all great things. Another related question here. So as a student from a school with uh, maybe a new school, and only a single shot at making a good impression because of COVID, what's one of the good ways for me to send a message saying, quote, this is what I wanna do, this is where I wanna be, please consider me for your residency. So I would encourage you guys to kind of have some preseason top tens. 
and find out where those programs are. Learn about those programs, understand why they're your top 10. If it's your top 10 because it's in a really cool city with live music and great food, um, I'm not sure that qualifies. Maybe it's near skiing, that might get exposed. Um, it needs to be more about the type of they offer, the people that are there. Maybe you uh, met someone at a conference. Maybe you've read their research. Maybe you're familiar with other students that have trained there that have received good training. Any of those unique specifics are, I think, points that need to be listed in the personal statement and also communicated in any pre-contact that you might make and or any kind of interview topics. So if you just say something like, you guys seem like a big name. Mom would be really proud if I went to Harvard. That's why I applied, okay? Again, Taco Bell mild sauce. I don't know if I would do that. So make sure you have specifics. Make sure you communicate them. Not in an overbearing way where you're sending love letters to the program director every day. She might get a little bit offended by that. But I'm talking about just occasional one email. Say, hey, I'm applying to your program. Uh, my, my brother uh, trained there. Or, you know, my older sister uh, had a friend, did residency there at the same hospital. Really find your program to be a respectful, good training program. I've seen your attendings come out, worked with them. Something like that that makes sense. Otherwise, you're just playing geographical darts. So hope that helps. All right, well, I think I'm out of maybe the good question. There's a couple of wild questions out there, but um, what else did you guys have as far as questions? And I'll close with a funny story. All right, so this is a uh, interesting article called The Art of Pimping. And uh, I, I really don't like pimping. It's a topic that I teach faculty development to a lot and, and do a lot for faculty development, but um, there's actually this, this, this thing out there. So I made this, this fun little video. These are all actors, by the way. These are some of my former students, now residents. But if you ever get cornered into pimping, um, there's a few techniques that I'd like to offer you to deflect the power of the pimp. So watch Jordan. She's the uh, gal here with the black hair in the middle. Okay, so, we so just what you've got is you've got this rude ascending, like lining up students in a firing symptoms. squad. So, uh, and Jordan is going to dodge a temp question by camouflaging okay, so herself behind the taller student, uh, okay, which makes it a little more difficult thing. to ask a question when How you're camouflaged uh, in the back. Uh, now, if great, that doesn't answer, work and you're still able to be seen, you might do the total eclipse. I mean, you can't even see her there, right? Sean, she performed a complete um, eclipse by getting behind the big group. The okay, next one's more yes, advanced. We're going to say some food. And right before that. you get a question, then, uh, you stuff them up and right in your mouth. Because no um, one would be rude enough to ask a question uh, of somebody with food in their mouth. So the guy beside her gets the, the question. All right. So that's after like a tertiary syphilis or... Now this next one is kind of a multi-step approach. What you've got, the guy's going to do is he's going to ask questions to everybody. Say, okay, give me an example. You do the next, the next, the next. So what you do is you uh, pretend you're meditating like, you over know, your patient for, list or maybe some you're interesting right, article, and, and then when it comes should, to you, okay. what you so do is you fake repeat what the first student said. Painless genital ulcer. Oh, good. Genital ulcer. Okay. Jordan? Oh, uh, uh, rash. Okay, that's a pretty yeah, answer. Yeah, she already rash, rash, but she just fake repeat it. You're so interested in doing your reading up on your patient that you were obviously distracted. Can anybody The last thing you can do is pretty soon you're going to get cornered, and you might have to philosophize. You know, Dr. Weeders, that's a really good question with a lot of clinical relevance, but I think a better question might be, do we need to Do we need to treat syphilis anyway? Very profound question. These are the questions that plague our minds late at night. Very good. So, so if you do get cornered, I want you to consider some of these stages, mechanisms for avoiding something, and they might serve you well in your and clinical the treatment, but a great question by Jordan. Well, guys, we you're matriculating to the next year. You're jumping into the deep water, and I think some of the things we talked about tonight will hopefully get you uh, to where you need to go. I uh, hope this has been helpful for you guys. I know it's recorded. I appreciate so much that you've taken your time to spend with me tonight. Best wishes to you. I hope to see you in the emergency department soon. Adios.